Picture this. You've finished making your website and you want to show it to your friends, so you share the URL only to find that it doesn't work for them. What you'll actually find is that your website is local and isn't on the web, and that's because, well, that's not how the internet works. But why? Is it hard to actually put a website online? What was that string of numbers in the URL from the VS Code preview? Well, today we're going to be diving into all of that as we explain the process of how you actually put your website online. By the end of this video, you'll not only know the process of getting your website online, but you'll have a basic understanding of how the internet works. Sounds exciting? Well then, let's get into it. First things first, what is the typical process of getting a website on the internet? On a basic level, it boils down to four steps. First, we have to register a domain name with a registrar. This is where we get a name that you want people to use to get to your website. It's something usually chosen because it's easy to remember. Google.com, Reddit.com, or has a large Hadron Collider destroyed the world yet.com are all examples of a domain URL. Second, we have to choose a web hosting provider for storing and serving the website files and data to the people visiting. Third, we transfer the website content to the hosting provider and make sure that it's set up correctly. And lastly, we make the website public. Now, for better or worse, each of these steps requires a bit of paperwork and a bit of money. And that may be frustrating because, look, you've got a perfectly good static website running on your laptop. Why would you need to use anything else? Well, there are a few good reasons, and one of them is right in that original URL that you tried to share. So what was that number that's in the URL for your website? It's actually part of something very important for how the internet works. And that something is called an internet protocol address or IP address. And like a home address, it's an identifying number that computers and networks use to know who is who. They come in two flavors, local IP, which is what you saw when you previewed your page in your browser, and then public IP, which is the address of your computer network for use on the internet. It may sound complicated, but think of it like this. Let's say you have a friend that lives on the same street as you in your neighborhood. So you say to them, hey, come on over to 300 Main Street later to play some games. That neighbor then has your house number and knows where to go to reach you. But what if they didn't live on your street or even in your country? 300 Main Street might lead them to a very different place in their local neighborhood than in yours. And that's what's happening on your friend's computer when you share your local address. It's going to the place that you've told it to, only that address goes to a different place on their network than from you. What they need is your public IP address. However, with the public IP, there's another challenge. They're not easy to remember and they can change. And that's why we use domain names instead. The system that we use to swap names for the IP address is called DNS or domain name system. It takes that domain name that you give it and gives you back the actual IP address of the site or service that you want to go to. This is what's called resolving the server. And it actually involves multiple servers with a resolver bouncing back and forth between what they call a root server, who tells the resolver the right top level domain server to contact, who tells the resolver where to go for the authority name server, who has the records of the actual IP addresses that you want to connect to. It sounds complicated, but what's important to take away is that it's like if you crossed a translator with a GPS. DNS takes your requests, translates them to computer speak, and finds the address where the browser needs to go. Another issue DNS solves is the chaos if you had multiple people wanting to use the same domain name. How would you know who the real one was? DNS solves this, and it's also why we have registrars and pay for the operational and administrative costs that come with maintaining this whole system. Now, could you connect someone to your computer without a domain? You could, but now would probably be a good time to explain why many don't and opt instead for a hosted solution. So why don't people run their websites just from their home computer? While you could save a few bucks by trying to do this all yourself, there are a few reasons why people choose to use hosted servers instead. The first of which is speed and reliability of hosted solutions. They'll be using servers, which are specialized computers built for hosting, connected to reliable infrastructure to make sure that the site is up 24 seven. 
While your laptop may work to serve a few people, you are probably going to be limited by the computing power or speed of your own internet, not to mention your computer is going to have to be connected and online whenever you want people to have access. If your system is down, your website is also down. Also with hosted solutions, they often have a dedicated team that oversees the maintenance of the servers and services. So you don't have to worry about things like security updates or configuring things like the DNS. So overall, paying for hosting means that you can focus on building websites instead of getting bogged down in server maintenance. And if you're looking for a hosting solution, you might be interested in today's sponsor, SiteGround. Now, how do you choose the right web host for your website? There are a lot of cheap options out there, but when it comes to hosting, you kind of get what you pay for. One company I would definitely avoid is any host owned by Newfold, which used to be called EIG. They've acquired companies like Bluehost, HostGator, and others, and unfortunately, there are tons of horror stories of how bad they are. I would also steer clear of GoDaddy for a lot of the same reasons. Now, the web host that I personally have used for my own website for the past seven years is SiteGround, which is a sponsor of this video, but I genuinely like them, which is why I've chosen to work with them as a sponsor. They are a premium web host, so they're not the cheapest, but in my opinion, it's been worth it because I can trust that my website will be secure, fast, and that I can rely on their customer support, which is a pretty big deal these days. A lot of companies are relying on cheap AI-powered chatbots, which are incredibly frustrating to work with if you're a customer. Customer. But just recently, I created a test SiteGround account and logged a question in their support, and I was immediately chatting with an actual human who was able to help me with the very specific question that I had. In addition, SiteGround does a lot of security and maintenance work for you. For example, on my WordPress website, SiteGround can automatically handle all of the PHP, WordPress, and even plugin updates so I don't have to worry about it myself. And if anything ever goes wrong, either in my code or if I ever get hacked, I can easily revert to one of the daily backups that SiteGround runs for me. So whether you're looking for a place to host your first website or you're a freelancer managing multiple sites for clients, I think SiteGround is a great option that you should definitely consider. And if you want to check them out, I do have a link down below in the description. So that's how we get a website up online and why we do it that way. Now, if you found this video interesting and want to learn more about building websites, check out the video above up here. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.